good afternoon or evening, depending on your location right now. My name is Christina Straub and I am Professor Emerita at Carnegie Mellon University, as well as a scholar and lover of 17th and 18th century theater. This event is intended as an informal and fun conversation about a play. The Convent of Pleasure, a closet drama written by Margaret Cavendish, first published in 1668. Before we talk about this play, we're going to see a bit of scene work from it, thanks to the work of my colleagues in theater. After the scene work, we will hear some thoughts from our director and dramaturg, but we are eager to hear how you, the audience, respond to this play by a woman about women and pleasure. What we hear today will be recorded and serve as food for thought for a spring 2022 online production of this play by Red Bull Theater, a classical theater company based in New York City. Please stay, stay tuned, I hope in a few weeks, for more information about this, income, this forthcoming event. I have folks to thank, of course, as one always does at the beginning of these events. I want to acknowledge CAS, the Center for Arts and Society for their support for this event. We could not do without the ever creative and competent leadership of Jim Dusing, the head of CAS, and thanks to the technical support of Petra Floyd, RRA. I also want to thank Jesse Berger of Red Bull for suggesting this play for our performance, Kim Weald for taking on direction, Misty Anderson for dramaturging, Wendy Ahrens for moderating tonight, and our actors, Clotilde Horn and Jessica Ranville, for agreeing to bring a bit of Cavendish's play to life this evening. I want to thank my colleagues as well in the R18 Collective, a small but extremely tough international team of theater scholars who are dedicated to promoting collaboration between theater makers and theater scholars in the production of plays from the long 18th century, a period that is critical to modern formations of identity, community, and social conflict as we experience them today. Misty Anderson, Danny O'Quinn, Lisa Freeman, Tracy Davis, and David Taylor, you are inspirations for the power of collaboration. Collaboration drives this event tonight. CAS is a center that is dedicated to nurturing connections between humanities scholars and artists. And in that spirit, you are all welcome to join us today in bringing this almost 400 year old play to life in 2021. 22. Finally, it's my very great pleasure to introduce my colleague Wendy Ahrens, who will be Mistress of Ceremonies and Moderator. Wendy brings two huge qualifications to this job. First of all, what better moderator for a discussion about a play than the coordinator of the dramaturgy option in the CMU School of Drama? Wendy is also the author of a blog that many of us depend on for intelligent, generous guidance to local theater. Her Pittsburgh Tatler. In addition, and this is a massive addition, she is a scholar of 18th century German theater, the author of Performance and Femininity in 18th Century German Women's Writing, The Impossible Act, and more recently, head editor and translator of G.E. Lessing's Hamburg Dramaturgy, a truly monumental work from the 18th century and an expert in black letter German, Wendy, God help you. She has many other things as well, including a wonderful colleague, but I need to stop talking now. Wendy, please take over. Thank you, Christina. Thanks so much. Um, and it's so great to see so many people here to, uh, to, to enjoy Cavendish's work. Um, so I'm going to introduce uh, our director, dramaturg and actors, and then give you all a little just uh, overview of how the day's program is going to go. So our director for today's performance is my colleague and dear friend Kim Weald. Uh, she teaches directing here at Carnegie Mellon University and she heads the John Wells directing program. Uh, Kim Weald is the artistic director of the New York based Our Voices, which is an innovative live performance company dedicated to creating and producing original theatrical experiences that give voice to marginalized populations. Uh, possessing an extensive knowledge of new play and musical development, 
Uh, Kim Wield is known for creating visually stunning, physically fluid ensemble-based productions ranging from intimate chamber pieces to grand spectacle. And her work has been seen, get ready for this list folks, at Shakespeare's Globe, London, at Lincoln Center, Carnegie Hall, New York Theater Workshop, Cherry Lane Theater, Arts Emerson, Red Bull Theater, Pittsburgh's very own City Theater, the Mark Taper Forum, Williamstown Theater Festival, the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, Teatro a la Scala, and Wolf Trap Performing Arts Center, among many other storied venues. Um, she is the director of the acclaimed American Moor, a one-man show written and performed by Keith Campbellton Hobb, and she will be directing the full stage reading of The Convent of Pleasure at Red Bull this coming spring. Our dramaturg for today's performance is Misty Anderson, who is the James R. Cox Professor of English at University of Tennessee, Knoxville. She is the author or editor of several books on 18th century theater, including Female Playwrights in 18th Century Comedy, Negotiating Marriage on the London Stage, uh, the two-volume Rutledge Anthology of Restoration in 18th Century Drama, and the Rutledge Anthology of Restoration in 18th Century Performance, as well as numerous articles on 18th century literature and theater. She's currently at work on a third book project, God on Stage, and also the R18 Collective, which is a consortium of international scholars fostering professional productions of restoration in 18th century plays relevant to our current day. And one of the delights of my pandemic year was actually watching some of these R18 performances. Uh, I don't think I laughed as hard um, at anything as I did at some of those performances last year. Uh, Professor Anderson puts her scholarship into practice as a producer and dramaturg. She's the executive producer and writer on the documentary, The Busybody and Performance, which aired in 2017. And she's also worked as a dramaturg on productions of The Busybody and Our Country's Good. And our performers today are Clotilde Horn and Jessica Ranville. Ms. Horn has performed regularly in the regional theater as well as off-Broadway and on television and film with frequent stints at Shakespeare and Company and Trinity Rep. She recently starred in the film, The Promotion, films, I should say, The Promotion and Driving While Black Magic. And she is also a theater director and an educator. And Jessica Ranville is a singer performer who has appeared at Baltimore Center Stage, the Pearl Theater, the New Ohio Theater, Here Arts Center, and La Mama, and has contributed to residencies at IRT Theater, Mabu Mines, the Drama League, and Brooklyn Arts Exchange. And this past summer, Jessica created an original solo performance piece, Traveler, while in residency at IRT. So before we continue, um, I have a little Zoom housekeeping to walk you through. If you haven't yet, please click on the little up arrow that is next to the camera at the bottom uh, left of your screen, choose video settings, and then scroll down a little bit to select the high setting, hide non-video participants. And once you've done that, close that window and please turn off your camera. This is going to allow us to spotlight and isolate our performers during the scene work. And in addition, please check at this point to make sure that you are muted. So our program today is going to run as follows. We're going to have a presentation of a scene from the Convent of Pleasure uh, by our two actors. And then we're gonna take about 10 minutes for Kim, Misty, and the actors to discuss the scene and do a little bit of dramaturgical work in front of us. And then they'll, re they'll repeat the reading. And after that, we are going to open the floor for a conversation among all participants in the room about the scene we've just enjoyed, the play as a whole, and 17th century pleasures, theatrical and otherwise. And at that point, we will invite you all to turn your cameras back on and I'll ask you to use the Zoom raise hand feature to participate in the conversation and the Q&A. And so without further ado, I'm gonna turn off my camera and I'm gonna hand things over to Kim, Misty and the performers who are going to delight our senses with a scene from Cavendish's The Convent of Pleasure. Thank you so much, Wendy, for those generous introductions. It is an absolute thrill to be with you all, um, to be working with Kim, Wendy, and uh, so many other talented folks. Um, I want to set up the scene that we're going to see with just a little bit of context that might make it more pleasurable for you. Um, while this play was never performed in Cavendish's lifetime, uh, other theater companies have discovered it. We're not the first, but we are among the first. The scene that we'll read this afternoon comes just after the top of Act Four, which opens with Lady Happy agonizing and confessing she is lovesick for the princess, wondering, quote, why may not I love a woman with the same affection I could a man? Then, 
After some no no's and protests, she finds herself in the arms of the princess, kissing, embracing, and declaring, these my embraces, though of a female kind, may be as fervent as the masculine kind. This is hot stuff. Um, but because this play requires a challenging tech plot and multiple costume changes, we are picking up shortly after that steamy scene so that we can all track on Zoom. Also, I thought that would be a nice little teaser because we expect you all back at the Red Bull production in March to see just what we do with that. Um, as in Cavendish's scientific writing, uh, in the speeches we'll try out this afternoon, we find a speculative non-binary approach to a transformable vital world. Uh, as in her infamous visit to the Royal Society the year before she wrote this play, in which she appeared in a mashup of men's and women's clothing, Cavendish's queer sensibility extends to the way she imagines the material world itself. She holds open an imaginative, ludic contingency for world-making performance. With that, I'll hand it off to Kim. Thank you, Misty. Uh, we're thrilled that everybody is here joining us today. Um, and you set that up so beautifully, Misty, that I basically want to say to Clotilde, who will be playing Lady Happy, and Jessica, who will be playing the princess, why don't we dive in? How does that sound, right? So Jess, take it away. My shepherdess, your wit flies high up to the sky and views the gates of heaven, which are the planet seven, sees how fixed stars are placed and how the meteors waste. What makes the snow so white and how the sun makes light. What makes the biting cold on everything take hold? And hail a mixed degree twixt snow and ice you see. From whence the winds do blow, what thunder is you know. And what makes lightning flow like liquid streams you show. From sky you come to the earth and view each creature's birth. Sink to the center deep where all dead bodies sleep and there observe to know what makes the minerals grow, how vegetables sprout and how the plants come out. Take notice of all the seed and what the earth doth breed. Then view the springs below and mark how waters flow, what makes the tides to rise up proudly to the skies and shrinking back descend as fearing to offend. Also your wit doth view the vapor and the dew in summer's heat, that wet doth seem like the earth's sweat. In winter time, that dew like paints white to the view. Cold makes that thick white dry as cirrus as cirrus it doth lie on the earth's black face, so fair as painted ladies are. But when a heat is felt, that frosty paint doth melt. Thus heaven and earth you view and see what's old, what's new, how bodies transmigrate. Lives are predestinate. Thus doth your doth your wit, thus doth your wit reveal what nature would conceal. My shepherd, all those that live do know it that you are born a poet. Your wit doth search mankind in body and in mind. The appetites you measure and weigh each several pleasure to figure every passion and every humor's fashion, see how the fancies rot and what make every thought. Fathom conceptions low from whence opinions flow. Observe the memory's length and understanding's strength. Your wit Doth reason find the center of the mind wherein the rational soul doth govern and control? There doth she sit in state, predestinate by fate, and by the gods decree that sovereign she should be. And thus your wit can tell how souls and bodies dwell and that the mind dwells in the brain, and the mind, the soul, 
doth reign. And in the soul the life doth last, for with the body it doth die, but live in the world's memory. May I live in your favor and be possessed with your love and person is the height of my ambitions. I can neither deny you my love nor person. In amorous pastoral verse, we did not woo as other pastoral lovers used to do. Which doth express, we shall be more constant be. And in a married life, better agree. We shall agree, for we true love inherit, join as one body and soul, or heavenly spirit. Let me tell you, servant, that our custom is to dance about this maypole, and that pair which dances best is crowned king and queen of all the shepherds and shepherdess this year. Which sport, if it please you, we will begin. Nothing, sweetest mistress, that pleases you can displease me. Wow. What a fantastic, what a fantastic pass. Wow, I'm very excited, Kim. <laughs> Yes, well, well done. So um, I thought, so Wendy, were you gonna ask us a few questions and then? Sure, I actually, I, I, wanna, I wanna start just by asking um, the actors to maybe talk a little bit about sort of, you know, the work that you've just done on this scene. Is there any way in which it was different than the kind of work you might do to prepare, you know, like a, a, a similar material from the time period, Shakespeare, you know? Jack Bean kind of stuff, or was there anything different in your approach? Um, I would say, um, you know, I think I mentioned this to Kim and Clotilde the other day that there's something about this play that is very, um, like a little disarming. Um, I couldn't really think, I couldn't, like, I, I couldn't really, see ahead of what was going to happen compared to other plays that I've encountered. Like, okay, so the woman is in this position and they're the lover and this is what's gonna happen. Um, it felt very fresh to me and um, it didn't really follow the sort of like, the, the sort of dramaturgical shape that I was used to. Um, I think I was saying that there was like not as much like there was, it's just, there's just like so much joy and boldness in these two characters. So I think I was just trying to make room for that really. And um, just, yeah, just make space for it in, in the reading of it. Yeah, I, I join you with that, um, Jessica, because there's something about like these thoughts, like, I mean, you know, a part of the reason why we're leaning into this particular section of the piece is that this language, these thoughts are so like, they're, they are thick, they're really thick. And, and yet they're so embodied. And there's like this deep, um, like spiritual quality to like, just her understanding and that she's able to like reveal through, you know, her writing, about like how, how nature is mirroring uh, you know, this experience of ripening love. And so I think that there are ways in which, you know, my experience with Shakespeare, like, supported, like, my basic understanding of it. But this is, like, this is a whole nother level, you know? Like, this is, like, I'm, I'm still trying to understand, you know, like, the rhythm of her thoughts and the ways that she's, um, you know, the way that she's really unfolding. I think that's, like, the best word I can come mm -hmm. up with unfolding this experience because I it's it's you're right it's not something that you can really get ahead of so you really have to be so present with the thought at each at each syllable literally so so it's kind of different but also it's refreshing I think that's a great word Jessica yeah. mm -hmm. it's just I want to pick up on on something there from when we 
talked just on Monday briefly about this is is taking time with this text. And I think Clotilde, you're 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 saying it so well about finding the rhythms of her thoughts. There's the rhythm of Cavendish's thoughts, right? And then the, the rhythm of the individual characters. And there's also, as Misty set it up, you know, right before this, they have they have kissed and these these amazing speeches that they have are so rich ripe florid in a beautiful in a, in a beautiful way and and nature which you know how she talks about nature there is that you can feel the the blossoming the growing the expansiveness and also the idea of the expansiveness of queer love to be authentically in a moment to suddenly authentically be yourself and and what that what that can be everything becomes brighter everything becomes that much more special then it, it becomes how do we activate all of that in in the acting of it right there's the dramaturgical the text work the table work and then there's activating it as actors which you do beautifully misty i think you were going to say something no i i'm I, i'm so excited about this and i think that some of this activation that we're talking about because this is this is kind of natural philosophy, right? But it's an it's natural philosophy, which I mean, we would call it like early science. Um, Cavendish herself had attended the Royal Society, which would be kind of we don't have a, a perfect parallel, but it's a collection of early modern scientists who get together to literally run experiments in public. And in fact, um, Al Koppel and others have written about this as theater. Right. Um, so she had she had come to share in the exchange of ideas. Uh, she had written many philosophical texts. And the fact that um, that Jess, you know, your speech as the princess is what comes out of this kiss. Right. Um, after you have entered the convent of pleasure, um, the only uh, the, the only nominal male who's been able to get in. Um, but who in the life world of the play is not identified, even in the, um, in the cast list, right? You're only identified as the princess. So you're running a kind of experiment um, as well that is this wonderfully sparky um, exchange um, between the two of them and the way that that relationship has been building because Lady Happy is running an experiment too. It's the convent. You know, what would an all female space look like that was dedicated to pleasure? There were certainly convents. Cavendish was living in an old abbey when she wrote this, um, Welbeck Abbey. That was known, but this is a sort of what if it's a convent of pleasure, right? That's the proposition of the title. Um, so that experimental quality is everywhere and animating it in these longer speeches is both a sort of, is, is a challenge, right? But it's coming out of this almost, you know, explosive um, account that the princess is giving of how the world works. So I have another question and I'm not sure who to address this to, but it seems to me one really key moment in the scene is after the two long speeches. And I think it's the princess who says, we have wooed not in the way that pastoral lovers normally do. And I was thinking a lot about, you know, there's a lot packed into that because I think Cavendish's original audience was, would have known exactly what that was, right? What, what is the normal way pastoral lovers woo? It's also kind of a bit of a hint towards queer love, but it also is very much specific, specifically referring to a kind of pastoral tradition of, you know, in plays. So I guess the question I have is, uh, what was the mechanism you are using or what, what is the way to bring that kind of make that present for a present day audience who may not have any idea what what would be the pastoral you know convention and maybe this is a question for you kim or for you misty but it's, i'm curious because it seems like that's a very specific way of thinking about you know a, a convention that is being upended that may be a sideways way of thinking about queer love but it also might be a very specific way of just referring to like we should have done it this way and we didn't you know even if it had been kind of a straight convention well Kim, if you want me to take a stab, the short, the short 
interlude right before this scene introduces another shepherd, in fact, two shepherds and a shepherdess, but it's actually uh, Madame Mediator. So right before, right between the kiss and this scene, we have these other rural figures, performative rural figures who are supposed to be figures of simplicity, right? The, the notion that the pastoral is the site of some kind of more basic experience of what it means to be human. And so that comes in between. And then we have the princess's speech, um, which is this kind of philosophical wooing um, in that uh, that, isn't, that isn't normal. Of course, the pastoral is also a scene of sex, right? Of a kind of simple sexuality, a basic sexuality closer to the natural world. And I think that that's where this gets its queer credibility because to unpack that is to rethink how you see the natural world. What counts as natural? So adding to that in terms of what comes after the section is we go to Neptune and mermaids. So there's, there is absolutely that the, the, the traditional pastoral, right? Um, and the idea in, in my version, in my head as a director, those roles are actually being played all by women. Uh, but, and we can talk about this later, I also envision potentially the use of media inside of a production of this and what that could be. And so there, there could be in media the, the, the morphing of a traditional pastoral into this other thing as the kiss happens and as then that text happens. And uh, we're looking at history um, being brought forward into into the 21st century potentially uh and then i think the scene that happens after this and this it's interesting because this whole act four it's not you know the way she writes it's not divided into the scenes we have to divide it ourselves um i think that there's more than one scene in act four and i'm sure many of you here will tell me <laughs> um, but that when we get to Neptune and the mermaids, there's this other thing that really opens up into, it feels like in their commitment to one another it, that, and finding love with each other, they go to this even more magical place. Um, and there's even a more heightened kind of queering of the text, if that makes sense. So yeah. and to, to that, oh, I would just add one quick point that, that a lot of this is built on court mask, right? A very particular form in which these very short scenes don't conform so much to our sense of a, of a five act play, but rather interludes. And that is structurally just in the bones of this. So we should probably wrap this interlude up. And I, I wanna invite Kim, do, is there anything you would like to sort of offer to the actors as direction for the next iteration of the scene for, that comes out of this conversation. Yes, so I, I, we started to scratch, scratch the surface a little bit um, uh, with the first pass. I think you can go farther with the discovery of the wonder of the beauty of the world that you're now inhabiting together and discovering together that you also discover that in the other, as you're talking about the other person, right? What, and you're talking about nature, that that's also, you're seeing that in the other person. You know, when you fall in love and it can happen in an instant um, or over time, that, that suddenly the other person, you're seeing all the beauty and the world and the wonder of that other person. And so, my question for each of you is in those speeches, what are you doing to the other person? 
in order, you know, you know what I mean by that? And we, you know, we, we really would go through line by line and say, what are you doing here? What are you doing to the other person in order to what, right? And I understand too, that that's also taking a, it's, it's a, it's a different tactic and style uh, in terms of probably how this was originally written, meaning um, the philosophizing, the meditating on these themes, but that's also about activating, um, whether it's to woo, to seduce, uh, just play with it. Yes. Okay. And take your time is the other thing. Don't rush, take your time with it. And if you feel like, wait, I want to go back and, and try that line again or something by all means, absolutely do. Okay. Clotilde or Jess, do you have any other questions for that for Kim? Thank you. Thank you. And just, just take it away when you're ready. My shepherdess, your wit flies high up to the sky and views the gates of heaven, which are the planet seven. Sees how fixed stars are placed and how the meteors waste. What makes the snow so white and how the sun makes light? What makes the biting cold on everything take hold? And hail a mixed degree twixt snow and ice you see, and whence the winds do blow, what thunder is, you know, and what makes lightning flow like liquid streams, you show. From sky you come to the earth and view each creature's birth, sink to the center deep where all dead bodies sleep and there observe to know what makes the minerals grow, how vegetables sprout, and how the plants come out. Take notice of all the seed and what the earth doth breed. Then view the springs below and mark how waters flow. What makes the tides to rise up proudly to the skies and shrinking back descend as fearing to offend. Also your wit doth view the vapor and the dew. In summer's heat, that wet doth seem like the earth's sweat. In winter time, that dew like paints white to the view. Cold makes that thick, white, dry, as cirrus it doth lie on the earth's black face, so fair as painted ladies are. But when a heat is felt, that frosty paint doth melt. Thus heaven and earth you view and see what's old, what's new, how bodies transmigrate, lives are predestinate. Thus doth your wit reveal what nature would conceal. My shepherd, all those that live do know it, <laughs> that you are born a poet. <laughs> your wit doth search mankind in body and and in mind the appetites you measure and weigh each several pleasures do figure every passion and every humor's fashion see how the fancies rot and what make every thought fathom conceptions Lo, from whence opinions flow, observe the memory's length and understanding's strength. Your wit doth reason find the center of the mind wherein the rational soul doth govern and control. There doth she sit in state predestinate by fate and by the gods decree that sovereign she should be and thus your wit 
can tell how souls and bodies dwell, as that the mind dwells in the brain. In the mind, the soul doth reign, and in the soul, the life doth last, for with the body it doth die, but live in the world's memory. May I live in your favor and be possessed with your love and person is the height of my ambitions. I can neither deny you, my love, nor person. In amorous pastoral verse, we did not woo as other pastoral lovers used to do. Which doth express we shall more constant be. And in a married life, better agree. We shall agree, for we true love inherit, join as one body and soul our heavenly spirit. Let me tell you, servant, <laughs> that our custom is to dance about this maypole, and that pair which dances best is crowned king and queen. And all the shepherds and the shepherdess this year, which sport, if it please you, we will begin. Nothing, sweetest mistress, that pleases you can displease me. <laughs> All right, so, uh... I want to invite uh, everyone who's in the Zoom room, um, please feel free to uh, turn on your camera uh, so that we can see everybody and give a round of applause if you'd like, either audibly or use your, thank you. Thank you so much, Jess and Clotilde. That was really, really beautiful. Hot, it was hot. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, here is our portion um, from here to the end of our, our time together for, uh, you know, to have open conversation and open question and answer. And I'd like, I, I would invite you all to use the, if you go under reactions where you see a little emoji down at the bottom of your screen, if you click on that, there is a raise hand feature and that will help me because there are uh, 40, 36 people in the room and I can't see everybody if you raise your hand physically. Um, but, and while I'm waiting for, um, you know, those of you to think about what it is you'd like to ask, I'm going to lob a question at the team. Um, and that is, and, and this is for all four of you, but maybe Kim, you want to take this first. What, what, because you're about to, uh, direct this play for Red Bull in the spring, the entire play. What do you see are the main challenges of directing this play for today's audience? That's a great question. <laughs> Um, I, you know, there are these, there's these speeches that, that kind of, she can meditate on that these meditations. And I think the biggest challenge is, is activating them because, you know, uh, creating, putting the energy inside of it about, um, you know, what kind of character is what character does. That's a that's an acting term, but it really is about how to activate the the scenes, the actors um, with the language, because the language is so extraordinary and it feels really, I think, good in the mouth, and you just want to luxuriate on it. Um, and the ideas are some of the ideas are I find there's such a depth to what she's saying and it's a little heady. So, it, so you have to dive in this, this, the process is going to require a lot of, of uh, table work and text work to make sure that we really fully understand not just what the characters are saying, but Cavendish's intent behind it. That's the dramaturgy and, you know, working with a dramaturg and then activating it in, in, in also the, the, the fun of what this is, and I say fun about she created a safe space for these women. Um, and I'm thinking a lot about if, if it should be an all-femme cast, actually. 
So it's just something else I'm thinking about. You know, as I'm looking at Peter Anderson's screen and, um, and backdrop, I'm thinking about something that Kim said, which is something that ran through my head the first time I read this play in graduate school. It was pre-green screen, but I was like, you know, can we get projectors, right? You know, the, the whole world morphs from scene to scene, and that is very much um, related to the substance of these speeches and the substance of the exchanges. And it's, I think, one of the things that's going to make it really fun um, to try out on Zoom, but then ideally to have a true theatrical destination where you, you can do some of this work through tech. And I think it would be really, really exciting. I don't know if this is uh, so much of a, this is all very exciting. First off, I'll, I'll say this is, it was really exciting to hear. And I'm, you know, I've been hearing the word queer used around and that's a very contemporary term. And this is a play written by a playwright who was born in 1623 or something around then. So like, how do you, you know, you know, with our contemporary sensibilities around queerness and all that, how do you not impose too much, or maybe you want to impose too much of our, our modern aesthetic onto it or have that reveal where we are today, if that makes sense. How are you gonna <laughs> balance those two things? Oh, it's a great question, Peter, and I don't have an answer. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm gonna take the historical stab at that, Peter, since that's my job. Um, uh, Cavendish created multiple sort of, um, let's call them like femtopias or spaces in which we have um, all female or near all female groupings, the female academy, Bell and Campo, and then Convent of Pleasure. So she's thinking about these questions. But there's a line that is in the preface to her 1662 collection of plays. She had written a collection of plays that she published before this. And in it, she says, I know that there are many scholastical and pedantic persons that will condemn my writings because I do not keep strictly to the masculine and feminine genders. And then she goes on to say more, you know, she, she sort of um, dismisses this notion that feminine and masculine, it means like lock and key. That's, that's the figure that she uses. And she says instead that, you know, she's, she's going off road. Is that queer? You're, you're asking absolutely, I think the right question. And we're making fast and loose with that term. But then what is she doing, especially if, we grant that certain ideas about masculinity and femininity and gender as we have inherited them um, take a lot of their shape, um, not whole cloth, but a lot of the landscaping happens in the late 17th and 18th centuries. So she's kind of jumping in at this moment and literally she sort of um, hybridized cross-dressed her way into the Royal Society. She's, she's actively thinking about these questions, although um, in other respects, I mean, she did get married um, to a man uh, very young, uh, but he was 35 years older than she um, and spent, her, spent a, a lot of formative time in exile with the court of Queen Henrietta Maria um, who was also interested in all female spaces, convent spaces. So I think that we can, we can reliably say it's a question. What do we call, how much do we lean into the connection to our own moment is I guess always the question we have to ask, right? Can I weigh in there for, on that question? I, I really always like the, um, uh, uh, concept that Valerie Traub, um, in, uh, comes up with this idea of cycles of salience, by which she simply means not that history exactly repeats itself, but that, that you can find echoes of similar kinds of um, affect, similar kinds of uh, formations of identity and desire uh, that, that echo throughout history. Um, I'm that the, the reading that you guys just did sort of lays on the table this um, the, a question for me, which is very relevant to this play, which is what is pleasure? 
um, how do we define pleasure? And, and your reading immediately took me to uh, Audre Lorde's um, feminist uh, critique of um of sexual pleasure and your your uh padlock and key uh image comes to mind here misty uh as this very narrow definition of sexual intercourse and lord talks about the erotic as something that is way broader and way bigger than um a very very narrow definition of sexual pleasure i i feel there's echoing between what Lord is saying and, and what's happening in this play. Uh, Tracy Davis, you have your hand up. Hi. Hi. I, I, I'm not camera worthy today. I'm, I'm fit only for grading papers, which is how I spent the day. But I wanted to pick up on this line of thought and talk a little bit about, or ask you to talk a little bit about how in a succession of scenes and situations in this play, the, the um, kind of dialectics of a homosocial utopia and a utopia of women's love for each other in, in different degrees and different formations and different physical acts works on a, a, a kind of scale of naturalization and unnaturalization. So that paradoxically, at least this is, how the play seemed to me, the, the scene with the naiads and the mermaids is the most acceptable, the most ordinary, and the scenes such as the one we just heard, I, I think if I'm placing it right in my memory, seems the most incredible in relation to a kind of standard um, heteronormativity. So, just just wondering what you think about that. Um, that is, Tracy, that's, that's a great thought. Um, I think, um, I think you may be on to something there. I and I'm and now I'm thinking about that scene, you know, that with Neptune, the mermaids, the juxtaposition there, right? And you're and against against this scene. And and my immediate impulse goes to a place of Oh, was that placed there then to to make to make this okay? Does that make sense? I don't know. I had. I mean, I. I. Um, another part of me is thinking about this aspect of. Well, actually, I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to leave it there. You just gave me a like a a huge gift, Tracy. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I, I, I'm glad that's the case, Kim, but I, I would say that this scene, the way I was thinking of it, it it's not what, uh, or, or the, the mermaids and naiads are not what makes this scene okay. It's what um, normalizes in a theatrical sense and makes extra queer in a social sense, the scene that we saw. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's, that's not, yes. And I, I didn't articulate what I was thinking well then because I, I didn't communicate it. Um, uh, yes, I get what you're, I understand what you're saying. And I, I agree. I need to also think though on on that juxtaposition more. I haven't had enough time marinating in the play um, and really pulling it apart. That's what my winter break is for <laughs> and really pulling it apart here. Um, yeah. But... Lisa, hi Lisa. 
Hi, Wendy. Hi, everyone. Uh, winter break, that sounds like such a wonderful, fantastical thing. Um, <laughs> so far off. Um, still uh so i i guess i want to i want to circle back to something uh, that kim said earlier about um you know finding um the both the kind of rhythm of the of the play as a whole but also each of the characters having finding their rhythm within the text and figuring out how to i guess i think the phrase you used was getting your their mouths around it um which is a very a sort of sensual image in and of itself right um and and so I guess I really wanted to to point to, you know how well, first how wonderfully uh, our performers, um, you know, perform this language because it's you know it's all too easy to fall into some kind of sing songy rhymy kind of thing, but to find the pauses and the emphases and the the sort of um, you know the the gaps, um, and and I I guess one way to think about um you know how the 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 aspects of sexuality get um conveyed is to think about um you know that that that, that what they also were able to find was a difference in expression um that brings forward their own characters and others there's often like a flattening as if like the two female characters are are, are same represent a kind of sameness right so if you're going from a heterosexuality with its implicit sense of difference to a homosexuality with its implicit sense of sameness, um, just by the very root, roots of those words, right? Um, here we're seeing um, a way in which the way that language written perhaps in the same meter uh, can also be expressed so differently and bring forward different aspects of the character um, and as they come together, there's a kind of complementarity, perhaps, maybe, but also, you know, a, a, a parting. So I don't, I want, don't want to reduce it to like the complement coming together. So, um, and I thought that was really beautifully done, and 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 I was really kind of moved by um, how how well that was able to come out in just this brief vignette. So um, again, the, the attention to how language is delivered was really wonderful. So. And I don't know if anyone has anything to say about that, but I, I wanted to kind of note it um, in the text and in, in the performance. Frank Valentine. Hi, I had two thoughts, one of which is responding to Peter, which I was reflecting on. A great actor in a talk back once said, any play exists simultaneously in any production in the time of its writing, the time of its setting, and the time of its presentation. And the trick is to figure out your relation and your production to those three times. And I just thought that's a particular challenge presenting a historically displaced, queer-focused play in our contemporary moment. I just, I, uh, I'm in Chicago, but I would love to get to Pittsburgh in March and see how you work that out. The second thing I was thinking of was, and I was trying to remember Romeo and Juliet as sort of the archetypal heterosexual wooing scene, but I was struck the second time through by the fact that they each very express, express, expressly um, sort of submitted themselves to the other. And I would guess if one were to view heterosexual wooing scenes, that that's rarely as reciprocal as that scene characterized. Thank you. Uh, Kim, do you want to respond to that or should I ask the next person to speak? You can ask the next question. Uh, Maddie. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you all for that really uh, wonderful uh, sneak peek. I'm really excited about this production. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, the body and am I correct that this is gonna first be an online reading? Yeah? Yeah, so I'm just thinking about these issues that Cavendish is working through here about where eroticism lives in the body, in the mind, in the soul, right? And she's working through, you know, is it this kind of neoplatonic ideal from, from the court of Queen Henrietta Maria of, you know, souls have no sexes? Is it about 
Um, actually, pleasure and eros being rooted in the body. Like, what's the relationship between these these different kind of registers? And I'm thinking about how, if at all, like Zoom as a medium is a place to play with this question of sort of disembodiment, virtuality, and sort of um, abstraction that is part of what she's working through with with gender and sexuality here. Uh, thanks, Maddie. Um, I have, I mean, I've been thinking on, I have a lot of thoughts in, term, in terms of Zoom world and what can be done uh, in part from a design perspective um, and with the technology, but I'm also thinking about this as, I'll be frank, a, 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 a an opportunity to gather, to, to offer this um, as a, a first step towards an in-person production, because how we, this gets into how we approach work, um, uh, creating productions, the, the timeline for exploring complex or any any play or text is traditionally you get four weeks of rehearsal time which really when it comes down to tech and everything it reduces to two and a half weeks or three you can't do this play in two and a half three weeks you just can't so some of it is about figuring out what can be done and you're absolutely right. The body is so important in this play and what she's, what she's also what she's saying. And all of you, I have to tell you, I'm a little intimidated because I just can, I'm just in a room with insanely smart people who know Cavendish far better. You know, I, I had never, I had never heard of Cavendish before Jesse sent me this play and, and before Christian, and I'm just, thrilled to be a part of this but so okay enough about me being intimidated um so but it is to say i can see my director's eye a product a very full production of this but it requires and deserves time in exploration that is not normally given to this material in, in a fair and just way when talking about production. Um, we can sit and talk perhaps from a scholarly, scholarly perspective for a long time, or you all can, um, but, but the, the act of you know, what directors do is we paint three-dimensionally in time and space. And we work to bring in all of the thinking about what was going on when the play was written for the playwright. Also, you know, personally, politically, um, what was influencing her? Um, what does it mean? I know Wendy hates this question. What does it mean to do this play now? Uh, pulling out all of the, the multiple themes in this. It's such a rich, uh, deep play um, and exciting because of it being written when it was written. And these are certainly today, these are themes that people are talking about. Um, so Zoom, I have to tell you very early on with Zoom, there was a part of me that just reacted in a way of, I do not want to do anything on Zoom. It's, it felt very, it's very, cause it's, it's different. It's two dimensional, but we have, we have come a long way in a very short period of time with the pandemic in the past, you know, year and a half from March, 2020 
to December 2021 in terms of what can be, I've seen some pretty extraordinary things that have happened on Zoom Tomb with, with open broadcast systems and things like that. So it really becomes from a technical perspective what we choose choose to do and how we how we to choose to do that in terms of the, the platforms and technology. Am I answering your question, Maddie? I, I, I just think that's, that all sounds really interesting. I think that my, my kind of, my interest in, in this question of, of embodiment or disembodiment also is just thinking about how Cavendish, the, the way Cavendish thinks about like um, attraction as a sp spiritual or mental intellectual phenomenon, it can kind of slip into this like love is love, like flattening of the body and of queerness, right? And, and that's where I'm kind of just fascinated by like the interplay of embodiment and disembodiment when you try to stage this and to stage it like at least initially virtually. So everything you said is really interesting and, and helps me think about um, sort of the materiality of production as it relates to those abstract kind of questions. So thank so, you. I do so just one more thing I want to say about that. Sorry, Wendy, one, one more thing, Maddie, because that's, that's another thing about taking, taking the play, I know you all know this, from page to stage, there's this, there's this area that happens where, you know, directors are interpretive artists. So it's also about what you're talking about with the soul, how she talks about that. I mean, there could be a dance. There could be music. There could be, how does that get, what is that representation materiality of that three-dimensionally as well as the ideas that she is speaking about? And sometimes it is as simple as having the actor stand and, and say, say the speech as well, or the scene. So um, yeah, I'll leave, it at, I'll leave it at that. Sorry, go ahead. No, what I was gonna say is, I, I see that we have two other hands up, but I actually really want to give a chance for Jess and Clotilde to address this question of embodiment because I felt very much, and I think others in the room did, that the second time you did the scene, I was more, much more aware of your bodies and of your embodiment of the role. And I'm just wondering how you are thinking about these roles and doing this work on Zoom because I know many actors have also kind of figured out Zoom in a new way as Kim was describing. Do you want to talk about like that kind of process of embodiment of the character? Well, um, I can say that I, I really um, relate to what Kim was saying about Zoom theater. Um, I've done quite a, you know, I've done a fair share of Zoom theater over the last year and a half or so. And um, there's a lot of really interesting things that have happened. Um, I really enjoy discovering new texts over Zoom and hearing them read. Um, uh, so I think there's a lot of opportunities over on Zoom theater. Um, at the same time, I uh, so much of the way that I work comes from the body, and uh, you know, the body speaks and the body communicates, and even in the sense of that brief session, work session we did just now about that feeling you have when you fall in love with someone, and suddenly, you know, like a, you could talk about like a channel opening up into like you know the, the natural world or the heavens or something, and you know, you're sort of like laid bare, you know, all of that is not something I would intellectualize or explore. Uh, you know, as an actor, I would I would take it into a space and 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 move move in that place, you know, and have text come from that place and inform voice and speech and and imagination and stuff. So um, I think that I'm, I'm like, oh, I'm being like open and embracing of Zoom and like the opportunities it allows and like how incredible it's been, you know, and at the same time still holding on to this like, I, you know, but at a certain point, like I got to get into a room, you know, and I think even the way that actors and directors work together and collaborate is kind of, you could say like a kind of a dance where like, even that in a room, I feel like, you know, when Kim and I were together, which has been too long since we were together, but like, I do feel like it, there's a, there, I do remember a lot of standing and a lot of like, okay, so, you know, like, um, 
I hope that I'm not like going off of this question now. It's a big question, but that's sort of my impression. That's like what comes to mind when you ask me about the body and, and working on a, a piece like this. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah, it's so yummy. I think that this, I mean, I really have been thinking a lot about all of the work that I do, like less like that these are body plays that like, I think that we have to be really understanding what it means to like be taking to be digesting this language through the body. Um, and I think that that's true for a, a lot of the work that I'm in encountering and as a person who is I'm such a physical person like touch communicates so much to me and so I mean I would be definitely eager to um, understand the intimacy of this play like in physical space and proximity but I would also say that like you know I've been loving the zoom I've been loving zoom it's been it's been you know to to find you know the obstacles and the challenges but then also the opportunities of it like there's something so intimate about um, this small little camera you know and and the intimacy that it actually allows in something and I think that you know I mean I think you were totally right about this Kim this is a piece that requires like you have to do you have to do the text work because then that actually informs the body, right? Like it, it's, 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 it's both and, right? And you have to learn how to work both of it because those thoughts are so, they're born from the body first, but then, but then they get communicated, right? So like, however you want to reverse engineer it, like it's just got to happen. But the process of getting this high, I, I, I want to say high intellect, it's like so deep it's so deep like the reservoirs of this language is so deep but because it's so deep intellectually that means it's even deeper in the body you know so like having to um just to have a place to kind of workshop that is i mean the potential of that is so ex is so exciting you know yeah thank you so much uh liza thank you for your patience no, that was a really, that was a great question from Maddie. I was very happy to hear the answers to it. Um, I had a question which maybe is directed more towards our, our actors than anyone, um, which is, I'm wondering the extent to which you considered that a performance where you were being Lady Happy and Princess respectively versus being the shepherd and the shepherdess, right? Because you are not, it's not technically a scene between Lady Happy and, and the princess. It's a scene where they are pretending to be a shepherd and shepherdess and like acting out that pastoral uh, message. And in fact, the, like so much of this play is formally a little bit strange, um, which she does on purpose in a lot of her dramas, right? Where there's all these miniature plays within plays about how much marriage sucks and, and stuff like that, right? Um, and so, so like, are you, are we envisioning this scene as just um, a continuation of the love scene, which I feel like was kind of how it introduced, or like how might it have changed your interpretation of those lines to have been the shepherdess rather than Lady Happy or the shepherd rather than the princess? Like, what do you do with that layering, essentially? I feel like I'd probably speak to my director <laughs> about that. Like that would be like a collaborative conversation. Um, I love that question. I'm just curious like about Kim's thoughts about it or Clotilde, like if you wanna jump in. The the first thought I have and it, because it is such a nuanced thing, right? It, and that feels like something that you definitely have to find through the embodiment of it. But like, but I think that, I mean, the the relationship that a shepherd and a shepherdess has with nature and and what that is like revealing um and and like and actually that by becoming those things and the layering of that of like owning like the that deep proximity that deep intimacy with nature i, I think that there's something to that that layering um which i think like there the reason why Lady Happy goes into the, you know, into this, you know, pleasure dome is like, I'm just trying to be, I'm trying to be and embrace nature, the the inherent design of all of what is in the natural world, you know. So I don't know. That's that's my first thought. But listen, I don't know what you think, Kim. 
I actually think it in part of it is about the staging, how it's staged, because it's also about transformation. It's entering into, and there's this other layer of transformation that happens. And so I think that design has the ability to support to support that, to support the transformation that happens. Um, and then um, I said this, I think about a week or so ago, speaking with Misty and Christina and Wendy, there's a quality of this play for me that's a little bit like a, it's a, a container within a container within a container. And I, and I feel like I'm always, I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, and I'm, I'm always, um, Clotilde said it earlier too, and unfolding. So for me, part of it's also about the staging. Um, yeah. Yeah, Liza, that was such a, a great point. And part of the problem in this little excerpt is that it is a play of excerpts. It's a play of these short scenes and moving between um, actions. But some of Kim's ideas um, about how we, how we use technology to realize those changes in a play that as Laura rightly pointed out in the chat, it doesn't really have production history um, it's not anything that ever got workshopped. And in fact, you know, William Cavendish uh, was suggesting changes and, and his entries include some of the downer moments, if you will, you know, where this sort of set of very gender fluid possibilities needs to crash down into the reveal um, uh, of, of the closing of the play. Um, but one of the ideas Kim had was when Lady Happy is describing the convent in the first place um, and kind of decorating it verbally. Uh, you know, what a great moment to kind of use the, the flatness of a screen or a projection and objects on the stage that would get at some of what we've been talking about, how to, how to stage a play that's engaged in a kind of neoplatonic, almost Rosicrucian um, sensibility about where love resides, where the self resides, souls and bodies. Um, it's up against Cavendish's own like richly tactile embodied set of scientific sensibilities. While personally, we know that she was painfully shy, that she um, she flubbed every you know big sort of conversation or encounter that she had, like when she finally got to meet Thomas Hobbes and just like froze. Um, so she had an experience of her body as not being as socially reliable as she wanted it to be. Um, and we're playing in that, um, in that space. Um, and I think that the changes and the constant character and costume changes are a way to kind of keep chasing after, you know, um, a, a form of embodiment that would, that would realize the intentions of the heart, the soul, um, to use her vocabulary. Wow, I love that. Uh, Carolyn. Hi, thank you very much. I'm sorry if my internet connection is a bit unstable in advance, but that was wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, I have a couple of, sort of separate but interrelated points. Um, firstly, coming back to the discussion about Zoom, um, something that always strikes me about producing this play now is that much as the development of this production comes at a time when we're recovering from or going through the end notes of fingers crossed a worldwide pandemic the play was written around a time when I saw a deadly plague had just petered out or an outbreak of uh, and I'm wondering whether there's a parallel between whether a zoom reading is a 21st century equivalent of a closet drama or whether that's a very too presentist an argument and um, but my other thoughts were along the lines of um, Misty had mentioned how indebted this play is to uh, court masks that we're fairly sure Margaret Cavendish had participated in. And there always feels to be a tension in Cavendish's work between the fact that these plays were ostensibly not written for public performance and yet are indebted to a genre that is so embedded in spectacle. I was wondering how you wanting to negotiate that tension when you perform it live. Great 
Great question, Caroline. And I also love what you were pulling out about it being written at the time of, at the end of another <laughs> pandemic plague. Um, again, it go, it, it's, it's part of it's the this, this staging um, and thinking about, you know, the role of masks then, what would it be, how, how is it now, what that tension is. And at the end of the day, we're storytellers, right? So what's gonna, honestly, what's gonna tell the best story? And the themes in the play, what are the themes that, you know, every director is gonna be drawn to certain themes and will work to bring those themes out in the storytelling. So, uh, so there's thinking on that. I, I personally love masks. So <laughs> um, it's, I'm excited about that. I'm also excited to talk to designers about what, what it is for them, you know, collaborate with people and, 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 and find out, you know, um, I mean, I had a, I, I literally had a dream the other night. It was dreaming on the play as I was sleeping. And I don't know if you all know who Taylor Mack is, um, but Taylor Mack showed up um, as a lamb. So go figure. <laughs> Strange, but true. So yeah, so I don't, it's, it's exciting to think about that and to think about structure. Um, and ultimately how, how we tell the story, right? making sure the story is communicated and the theme. Misty, you wanna jump in? You know, I was just looking at um, Sebastian's question about what is the mask um, today? And I, I love that you just brought in Taylor Mack. Um, you know, there's, there's this fantastically wonderful, um, you know, engagement, I mean, the, you know, the American Songbook Project and, and kind of digesting culture in, in a spectacular way. Somebody just pops, you know, the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, right? You know, that we've got, we've got a kind of um, largeness and the court mask, of course, was a place where um, uh, professional actors, but mainly not professional actors, members of court, um, uh, different people are participating. So there's also a a kind of crazy quilt quality um, and the importance of objects in, in masks as well, which I think comes back to some of the delicious bits that um, we have to play with again in a, in a play that is not that it's never been done before. Um, in fact, um, I think that the Minneapolis Fringe just did it, like just. Um, so I, I think that we're in a, in a great moment to rediscover um, the play, but most of the, um, these have mostly been fancy readings and with, with a, you know, a little OBS on Zoom and then perhaps a chance um, to really put it on its feet. We, um, we may be able to bring some of that Taylor Mac sensibility um, here to this play in a way that's responsible. Um, but we also don't owe, we don't owe the production history anything because there isn't much of one, right? What is it going to be? What, you know, we, we really do get to clean slate some things. Ooh, Liza, did you get to see that production? Ah. Yeah, it's in the, the Journal of Early Modern Women and Culture. I think I can, I, I think I sent it to Christina. Great. So let's take a quick moment to say thank you to Our Lady Happy Clotilde who needs to go to make her half hour for uh, Fires in the Mirror. Have a great performance, Clotilde. I appreciate you all. I appreciate everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye. Um, Ella, you're up. You have your hand up. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say that I loved that reading. And I think it like I've read the play a few times now, and I don't think I understood that passage until I saw it performed like that and just like see how the characters are discovering so much in one another um, of like nature and the world is really interesting. I also really liked the uh, the notion that like the convent is 
um, a space of, um, of like experimentation where the lady happy gets, you know, to figure out how to be happy, how to desire and experience pleasure without her anxieties about heteronormative marriage or childbirth or any of that getting in the way and where the, um, the princess gets to, you know, be this gender fluid femme until the sort of, as for as long as the convent is contained. Um, so I guess I'm just wondering how, I mean, I think it's already been um, discussed a bit, but I'm wondering how you guys are envisioning the juxtaposition, the juxtaposition of space between like the inside of the convent and the outside, you know, these moments where we see what's going on outside the convent or at the end of the play where it's sort of that encloisterment breaks out, you know, breaks down. So you have the, the world sort of re-entering this artificial space. I saw just very briefly, I, I, I saw some clips of a, a student uh, based production um, from the UK recently and the initial scene has male suitors trying to get into the convent unsuccessfully um, and it's played for, for laughs with this huge wall um that looks rather like the border wall and these guys sort of trying to clamber over each other to get inside um i thought it was kind of an interesting way of thinking about that division between the spaces uh, and it made the men look very foolish on the outside uh ella it's a great question and I, um, a really great question, because the space is so important. Um, it's intellectually, emotionally, and physically, the space that, that, that she as a woman creates for herself and for other women um, or female identifying. Uh, people so that it is about how to um, you know it, it's also interesting Christina what you're saying about a high wall because I think there's also it's really clear right this is an experiment and so there's also how do you set up what are the variables that you need to put in place to make sure that you create the best possible, uh, I, I'm blanking on the word right now, but um, circumstances for the experiment to, uh, to be conducted, right? And so um, part of this is also about collaboration with, with designers and, and talking through some of those scenes, actually. Um, it's images, it's also, um, you know, there are, I think, um, I don't know if you know, Ella, the, the cloisters um, in the, that are located in the upper part of Manhattan. Um, so that's not an abbey, but it's, that space is, is pretty, there's an outside and an inside kind of simultaneously that, that has potential um, in some way. So um, it's a great question. Yeah. It's a great question and it's gonna to need to be our last one because we're coming up on the time that we set aside for this. Um, and so um, I, I wanna thank Kim and our performers for the really um, hard work that they did and the really wonderful and lovely work. And I am going to invite Misty to kind of wrap this up and send us on our way, Misty. Thank you so much, Wendy. And thank you everyone who made time for this. I know this is grading time for a lot of us and I hope this was a happy study break um, for you. Um, it was also our first experiment in what we're affectionately calling crowdsource dramaturgy. Um, and your ideas and your great questions are now a part of this process. 
Um, and we're hoping that we'll continue to find ways to bring scholars and theater makers together. You know, Kim, you were talking about feeling intimidated by all of these scholars. Believe me, all these scholars feel intimidated by you. It is a joy to get to share um, our ideas across these fields of expertise and see if we can get more of these plays um, up onto stages so that we can talk and think about them and try to understand a little bit more um, about how they brought us to this moment, not to be presentist, um, but also what, what we do with them now. Um, so thanks everyone for coming. If you're not already a subscriber to the R18 Collective email, we don't spam you, but when we do events, we'll make sure that you know about them. Um, we have some more things coming up in the spring, but we will as soon as we have a date from Jesse Berger and the team at, uh, at Red Bull, we will let you know, and we look forward to seeing you there. Thanks so much. I also want to say, I also want to say, I put my email address in the chat. Please feel free to reach out. Like if you have a question or an idea or a thought, I mean, as as Misty said, it's crowdsourcing dramaturgy. Although she's gonna be my right hand person, so um, please, uh, by all means, email me. I'm I'm I would be thrilled to hear from you. I'm not sure this was a, a feminist utopia of the senses, but it was a bit utopian. Uh, in terms of bringing together a whole lot of uh, different sides for what makes theater so amazing. Audiences, makers, scholars, thank you all for coming. Have a lovely evening. Please take a moment, unmute, and let's give a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you. Woo! Thanks all. Great to see so many old friends here too. Wonderful. Oh. Here's to live theater again. <laughs> and dogs. dogs. And dogs. Yes. Sorry. My dog. Oh my.